OFC Facebook page are live streaming the final matches. Um, they happen at 2 this afternoon Australian time and at 5.30 and then on Saturday afternoon as well. Um, look, um, I'm just uh, warming up a wee bit so people can get used to my um, very Spanish accent. And so I just thought I'd give your ears a wee bit of time to attune. Um, the first thing I really want to do is uh, thank Stephen uh, um, for the funding and for the opportunity to go to uh, Fiji to watch the tournament. Um, I'd like to thank Ines as well for the support and the introductions to people and the travel tips and to Libby too. Libby, if you're on the line, thanks very much. Some of the um, tips that you gave me didn't always make sense at the time when you were giving me them, but sure enough, once I got there, they made lots of sense. So thanks very much for those as well. Um, I also want to acknowledge the team at um, the Oceania uh, Football Confederation as well, who are doing just some incredible work and obviously the players and teams and, and all the people that we met uh, at the tournament uh, in the last two weeks. Um, I should also um, thank um, the Australian Centre for Pacific Island Research as well and, for, and Mel for organising and Bridget for that lovely introduction there. Uh, for giving me the opportunity to share a, real, a story that really is just beginning, I think. Um, I, and, and I should say, as Bridget noted as well, that um, this is a work in progress in terms of uh, a piece of research. And in fact, if anything, um, the trip to Fiji just affirmed the, the fact that this is a conversation that's really just in its infancy um, in terms of uh, a research project. Um, so the first thing, I guess, um, this afternoon is for me to... Um, on there, um, ...is to give you a wee bit about, tell you a wee bit about the origins um, of the project um, and the game itself uh, as well. Hopefully you'll learn a wee bit. Now you'll have to be careful because I really love this stuff. So I will uh, get excited and talk really quickly and digress. And so I'm hoping that people, uh, Tash, you're sitting next to me, you can maybe give me a nudge uh, if, I'm, if I'm getting boring, right? Or people are falling asleep and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'll tell you a wee bit about the research um, as a whole and then a wee bit about the trip because it was absolutely amazing. And then a wee bit about what I think might come next. Um, so you can see there in the images, that's one from the tournament itself. That's Tahiti playing against PNG. PNG playing this afternoon, have to be one of the favourite teams. Um, Tahiti are already out. The two French teams went early. Um, and then that picture there is the first uh, team that ever played in Queensland. Um, well, a... Uh, um, well, not the first team that were formed, but the first team that played uh, publicly and openly. Um, uh, and they formed in Brisbane in 1921. So I'll tell you a wee bit about that stuff uh, as we go. Um, so on this slide, I really wanted to highlight the two of the histories that underpin the project. Um, I've been working on women's football in Australia for the last five years or so. It started with a local project in Brisbane. Um, actually, it started at a W League match with one of my daughters, uh, the youngest, who's very curious. She asked me how long women have been playing football for. So I went to have a look because, let's be honest, we're researchers. We should be doing these things. Um, and I found a game that took place in Brisbane in 1921 where an estimated crowd of 10,000 people watched two women play at the Gaba of all places, um, a few hours later, um, unknown to that group of women and unknown to this group of women, um, a few hours later, another game took place in Wellington between two representative sides uh, where 2,000 people watched that game in New Zealand, uh, literally hours apart, those two games. So that's a remarkable thing in itself, but not as remarkable as the fact that 1921 was the year that the English Football Association decided in their infinite wisdom, I'm being sarcastic, to ban women from playing football at all eh, for eh, the best part of 50 years. They didn't ban women from playing football necessarily, they just banned women from playing football anywhere you could play football. So, um, eh, so, um, so obviously learning these things, the, the first thing I did in 2016 was uh, I managed to secure some money from Arts Queensland and I went across to the UK um, to the Scottish Football Museum and to the, the National Football Museum, which is the English version of the same thing. And um, I met with some other historians uh, who are working on football history projects to see how they manage their projects, particularly around, um, you know, building histories and stuff like that. And then when I got back, uh, I secured some funding from Brisbane City Council and support from QUT, um, a former institution, as well as uh, support from 
uh, the State Library of Queensland and a number of partners. And uh, we started to develop uh, and uncover the history of the game here in Brisbane, the first women's teams, you know, that kind of thing, the game's emergence in the 1960s and 70s. And before we knew what was happening, we were speaking to all sorts of people and the work kind of grew into a, a statewide project. We soon realised, of course, that um, women's football was emerging around, around Australia and not just um, in Brisbane. Um, and, and obviously in New Zealand as well around that, that time in the 1920s and across a number of countries in Europe. Um, uh, what, what we see after the ban in the 1920s carried on in a few places, but uh, women's football started to emerge with the second wave, wave of feminism uh, in Europe uh, and, and here in Australia too and in New Zealand as well. Um, but FIFA, um, because they're um, brilliant at this stuff, um, didn't like the fact that they couldn't control women's football because women were doing it for themselves and independently, um, a, independent of the, the national organisations that were in charge of men's football. A, FIFA didn't like that, so they issued an edict. Um, it's really, like, as you can imagine, quietly done, but they strongly recommended that their members um, control women's football uh, which really meant suppress the game as much as possible unless it came under the control of the, the member associations. Um, but um, so uh, uh, it didn't stop the women um, themselves who continued to play. Um, and so by the late 1970s, we get to see uh, international football, women's football taking place in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, even we see a uh, regular uh, football being played in Fiji. Um, I've got some photographs uh, from newspaper articles that I found when I was over there. Um, the, um, so uh, just in terms of the story itself, so as I said, the, the, um, uh, you see the ban happening in 1921, but there's brilliant history being uncovered around that development. Then we see the game developing in the 70s. FIFA reluctantly put their name to a World, Women's World Cup competition in 1991. Um, and then um, I think what's really brilliant about being in researching this stuff in Australia is because a, like the, the game here has been at the forefront of, a, of the emergence of women's sport that way when it exploded into the mainstream in 2017 on the toes of Sam Kerr's boots of all things. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen it, but a really famous football game called um, FIFA. It's named annually, um, so FIFA 2022 is the first edition that has got women's football attached to it because of the, the, um, the levels of attention that the game's drawn and Sam Kerr and a number of her peers and colleagues feature. So it's really brilliant to see that stuff. Um, the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup attracted over a billion views uh, when it was played in France. And um, I don't know if you know this or not, but in 2023 next year, um, the Women's World Cup will take place in Australia and New Zealand. And I would imagine it will change the face of uh, the women's game here, um, but also uh, across the Oceania, uh, Pacific Islands region. Um, so those are the kind of two uh, um, narratives that are running alongside here. I haven't talked about the development of the project. I moved to USC in 2020 and we looked at um, delivering the project, which was a digital history that we delivered to Parliament uh, last year. That was really interesting to watch women playing football in the parliamentary green. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, thing to see uh, at the launch of that. And then we've been able to inform the, the Football Queensland's policy about the development of the women's game, as well as involve the scenery celebrations. Um, at the moment, we're working on um, two books uh, in particular, Women's Soccer in Oceania, um, and another one called Beach Soccer Histories as well, which is also for Rutledge, but uh, while I was in Fiji, I was able to pick up on uh, loads of material about beach soccer while I was over there and uh, meeting with Solomon Islands people. It uh, was absolutely brilliant doing that, the, the football people there. Um, right, I've talked enough about it. I told you to stop me when I get boring, right? Um, so look, so um, I just wanted to show you this diagram because up until 2021, I guess, um, these are some of the outputs that came out of that project, um, and some, some still continuing. So you see there, um, there's the, a, a range of traditional uh, research outputs in publications, book chapters, you know, like that kind of stuff. Um, there's the non-traditional research outputs in the, in the digital, um, in the digital uh, live, like archives, what do you call them? Living histories, if you like, digital histories, digital narratives. Uh, we also published our um, non-fiction text, 
um, that I've even got some royalties from, which is uh, amazing in itself. And then um, uh, we had um, a couple of exhibitions, um, a touring exhibition through the Brisbane City Council libraries, and uh, we've been engaged with uh, people overseas. We've also been on the radio a few times, um, appeared at the Brisbane Writers Festival, um, helped television shows with research, and, uh, and obviously uh, one of the key things of this type of research project is building partnerships and connections, so uh, you can see the list of universities and that there. Um, Look, this is more important, I think. Um, as a result of those kind of outputs around that football project, which was just really focused on the Australian game and, and the local game to Brisbane as well, uh, I was approached by Rutledge to write uh, a book about women's football. Um, that turned into two books. It was almost three books with Rutledge because the editor liked the ideas. And then I said no to the third one um, because, well, obviously two books is plenty if both books had got up. But as it turns out, another I am that we had in the fire uh, got up as well. So we're on the we're in the midst of producing two books and an edited anthology right now. So as you can imagine, things are pretty busy. Um, I'm working with a separate team on the Beach Soccer Histories book, but um, the these are my co these are my co-pilots on the book uh, for women's soccer in um, Oceania. Um, I was uh, I told the editors um, that um, we'd need a team of authors and it would need to be a uh, predominantly women because let's face it, I'm an old, a uh, fat, white, mediocre Scottish dad. You know, women's football in Oceania is really not my story. But fortunately, unfortunately, there's not many researchers working in women's sport at either a uh, USP or FNU, which are uh, clearly the two of the, the better institutions to, to tap into for these types of things. Um, and, and these projects, as they always do, need someone to drive them. So, like, I'm quite good at that stuff. Um, I was lucky enough to um, have been working with and met um, these two amazing women, um, Dr. Casey Simons, who I've been working with on a range of projects. Um, she's a, a massive sport, women's sports nerd, um, currently uh, initiating a research project on netball. And um, I think that she, uh, she's intended to work across the Pacific Islands as well, where the game's really popular. I think it's the number one sport for women in New Zealand at the present moment, although football will take over that very soon, I would imagine. And the uh, Associate Professor Yoko Kanemasu uh, is a sociology uh, of sports researcher um, at the USP. Um, she's been researching uh, Fiji rugby uh, and the culture around women's rugby in the sevens in particular, which is massive in Fiji. Um, I can't believe this, but in Fiji, like people who've been there will know this, but um, the government was so uh, enamoured with the men's rugby sevens winning the gold medal at the last Olympics that they produced a seven dollar note to commemorate it. Um, what's really... He's yeah, yeah. What's really bizarre? What's really bizarre about that is that while well, the men won the gold and their pictures and drawings are all over the note, the women's team won a bronze medal, and that's not mentioned or forgotten about. That's actually an old one. And there's a new, there's a new one. There's a new one. Oh, I sorry. Is that what you were showing it to me for? I thought you were just passing me money. Aye, so that's what it looks like. You can see there. Sorry, I'm such a monkey, I don't know. Right, so there you go. Thank you very much, Richard. Make sure you get that back. That's worth about $3.50. Um, so look, um, it's worth pointing out here that I think that um, this is not an anthropological study that we're working on, or even a gender study or a sociological study either, but it, it, does, it is related to each of those things, and we will touch on them. Uh, this is first and foremost a football study. Um, it's a study of a, narr a narrative construction. It's about bringing the hidden histories of women's football in the region together uh, so that we have all the stories in one place, um, gathering lost knowledges um, uh, so that people can build on that, so that people can understand the legacy of it, and so that people don't think that this is some kind of overnight success that's happening. You know, this stuff's been going on. These amazing women have been working at this stuff for a long time. We already know a fair bit about women's history uh, of football in Australia and in New Zealand now. We're really starting to Again, and that's not just myself now, that there's a whole bunch of researchers working across that stuff um, and it's becoming better known. But what we don't know a lot about is women's football in Melanesia, Micronesia and Polynesia. You know, it's undergone very little academic scrutiny. So that's, that's really what we're attempting to do here is map what's known, uh, gather it into one place and then look at that as, a, as an opportunity to identify and examine and address gaps uh, so that it helps us shape 
uh, future research so that we can look at emerging issues and what challenges there are that we can help uh, our partners, uh, help them document them, help them address them. Um, um, so I, I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the kind of aims of the research project here. Um, a great expression that you see in um, women's football is if you can see it, you can be it. And I guess that covers a whole a gamut of things. The, um, a, the heritage is little known. Um, there are very little knowledge of the times and challenges uh, and people who were involved in that stuff. We really want to acknowledge that and recognise the efforts that, that um, people have put into the game. Um, some people have been volunteering in women's football and working in women's football for 40 years just out of the love of that, you know, and I think that that's we forget that when we see Sam Kerr picking up a check for two million dollars a year for a salary, you know, and, and I think that's one of the things for me. Um, I think the other thing as well is, is that when we look at football, it's women's football in particular is already radicalised, you know, it's mediated by gender, it's mediated by class and ethnicity and generations and we have to look at those things. Um, we have to, um, I think, um, develop that narrative, you know, and that, that recovering as much of that as we can helps us identify the gaps. Um, and then, then it's an opportunity for us to start documenting how the game grows from here as well. I don't know if you've been keeping up with women's sport in the last five years, things have really accelerated. And then um, this morning, England, the England team, who, like, I have to say, I hate to see England winning anything um, as a Scotsman, but I think that um, it would be absolutely amazing if England win that um, win that tournament where they absolutely scalped Sweden 4 nothing this morning and um, it would just change the kind of a uh, media landscape around the game so much if they do the selling out stadiums and stuff like that would be amazing um, and so if we broaden access and public access to women's football and its heritage that allows us to highlight and support clear pathways for women and girls to participate in the game and develop careers out of this stuff in the way that men have been doing and taken for granted for a long time. Um, um, I think um, one of the things that's worth noting here as well is a research question. I'm going to read this out to you because honestly, it's not right, right? And it's about, if I was a PhD student and I gave this to my supervisor, my supervisor would kick my ass for it, right? But um, I guess um, we are investigating the ways uh, that the techniques and te technologies of storytelling can be combined with temporary, uh, contemporary community engagement practices to develop heritage and related knowledges, facilitate understanding and support participation in women's football in the Pacific Islands. Um, uh, I've delivered, like, we're talking about Oceania here for the book, but I think that's more because of the FIFA terminology that's applied to Australasia and to the Pacific Islands. But my, honestly, I have to say, my real interest is in developing the game where it most needs it in the Pacific Islands. Um, with the first projects, we set out to develop a narrative that pieced together individual histories so that as much as possible, we let other people tell their stories. We held exhibitions and we toured it around locally. Uh, we built a digital history website that people could access and contribute and that kind of stuff. Um, we also interviewed loads of people um, and we spent a fair amount of time doing archival research. Now, um, I've been able to interview, uh, I think, the three dozen people so far, um, and I keep getting brilliant leads to do more of them. Um, we've done some work on archival research, but obviously uh, the logistics of travelling to each country to look at their national archives and their newspapers and stuff like that is much harder. And obviously, um, uh, in some of these places, the digitisation of their newspapers uh, is something that's not taking place yet in the way that it has here in Australia. Um, but we've started there, you know, um, like we did with the uh, initial set sessions for the initial iterations of the project, we've made some great friends, we've built some fantastic relationships, uh, we managed to get some funding, and um, we drew in some great partners, and so we're looking at doing that now, where we continue those relationships with the friends that we have, we're uh, building new friendships, um, and uh, we did lots of work with that when I was across there. Um, we are looking for funding, so if anybody knows any sources, we'd be really happy to, uh, to discuss those things. Um, with the first projects, we got to present them at Parliament. As I said, we informed state-level uh, football strategies. We've uh, published academic papers, a non-fiction book appeared on radio, all that stuff, you know. Um, and we don't know if we'll get to do all of those things, but we'll be working on them. Um, we've obviously uh, started with uh, the uh, academic publications. You know, they're the first kind of 
terrifying Suva taxi ride off the rank, if you like. You know, um, uh, the geographical and technological barriers won't allow us to develop similar, a similar project. But to be honest, I don't know if that's what we should be doing here. I think it's much more about us looking to the community to see what they want to do, what they need. We know, for example, that um, the Fiji Football Association are developing a women's strategy just now, so we can give them some help with that. We know, um, for example, the um, no, uh, Solomon Islands, I say Solomon Islands, yeah, Solomon Islands are developing a strategy. The Fiji Football Association are looking to develop strategies about how they engage uh, the community and more players and stuff. So we talked about that a bit as well. Um, so there's a couple of things that we can work on, but these things have to come from the community. Um, in terms of our methodology, um, as I said, it's about it's about us speaking to the community and, and, and us working together to identify needs so that we can see how we can manage that. We've got brilliant resources here at, at, at UniSC and we've got great knowledge and expertise around this stuff. So it's about how we, how we manage that stuff. Um, uh, I think in terms of methodological approach to the research, everything begins with story. It all begins with story, sitting down. And I think that's beautiful because it speaks to the uh, indigenous the methodological approaches, you know, if you think about Talanoa and Fiji and things like that. And there are cultural discursive uh, approaches to data gathering, you know, that and they, they sit along, alongside this uh, long traditional oral history storytelling and that brilliant work that Patricia Levy did about filling in the space, you know, of, of history that's been lost through its a subjective, mostly patriarchal uh, approaches to its development. Um, we're looking at uh, working with um, practice re practices research. Um, that's what I am. I'm a practice researcher. Um, we're looking at uh, using critical uh, and historical football studies as well as exemplars and, uh, and looking at community engagement practices that enable the uh, participants to reveal the complexities in their experiences. This has been done with Indigenous communities here in Australia just now. And, and, and then uh, Fiji and other places. Um, these, this is some photographs from a, a conference I went to. Um, in the top of that photograph there, that's Emma Evans and, and Fanny. Um, Emma is the OFC Women's Development Manager. Um, she had a team of Williams, Women's Development Officers and I was really fortunate enough to spend a couple of days uh, in their conference training session. Um, and so what you're looking at the screen there, you've got Women's Development Officers from uh, Fiji, um, Tapuas from the Cook Islands, Maggie's from Vanuatu, Antoinette's from the Solomon Islands, and Charlotte there uh, is from uh, New Caledonia, Nouvelle Caledonie. Um, I, uh, my French is even worse than my English. Um, I know you probably find that hard to believe, but the, um, we, we did manage to strike up a conversation tonight, and through the gift of Google Translate, I managed to send a, a, a email uh, with the interview questions, and she sent me back an incredible incredible response. So uh, despite my own limitations in communication, uh, we've managed to get at least one interview in French as well. So um, right. so this is this is the football tournament that I went for. Um, I think um, the Oceania uh, Women's Nations Cup um, is the uh, generally the qualifier for the Women's World Cup. Usually New Zealand win this tournament uh, with some ease, um, but with New Zealand hosting the Women's World Cup, um, next year, um, they didn't need to play in the tournament. So this was an extraordinary event this time around because each of the teams that played in this tournament saw an opportunity to at least get to the next round of the qualification process um, and be named the outright champions of Oceania um, in this competition that's been dominated by Australia until 2006 and then of late um, New Zealand. So there was some really remarkable, there was a proper buzz in the air around this tournament, particularly in Fiji, where the Fijian side looked extraordinarily strong. Um, so you can imagine the home crowd, uh, but um, they, they would be one of my picks. Um, having said that, the student union uh, members at um, USP uh, and the FNU were uh, very excited about the prospect of watching the home nation uh, and I'd have to say um, the Vanuatu crowd and the Solomon Islands crowds were definitely some of the noisier crowds in the stadium, although the Tonga and Papua New Guinea match was an unbelievably noisy match as well. It was lots of fun to be in the stand. Um, so just so you know, um, there are 11 nations in the uh, OFC Confederation. That's um, a, a Polynesian teams, American Samoa, Cook Islands, um, Samoa, um, Tahiti uh, as part of French Polynesia, 
Tonga uh, and um, uh, Tuvalu are one of the two associate members. They're not full members of the Confederation yet. I can explain that in a bit more detail if you want. But um, And then Melanesian countries, you've got obviously Fiji, uh, Nouvelle, Caledonia, um, uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Solomon Islands, uh, Vanuatu, and the, and the only Micronesian nation um, uh, that we're looking at, mostly because there's only enough, there's only so much football activity uh, that can be can, uh, carried out in these um, uh, in these smaller countries, and that's Kiribati. Um, I hope I've pronounced these names properly. I, I, please accept my apologies if I have made an arse of any of those. Um, look, there are a number of other uh, Pacific Island nations who are involved uh, in football or have been involved in football, but no, both the North Mariana Islands and Guam are uh, part of the Asian Federation. And unbelievably, uh, the uh, Guam uh, Football Federation are one of the most powerful uh, organisations in uh, the Asian Football Confederation. A um, lot of politics going on there in Palau, Palau, if I said Palau, Palau and Niue, um, well, have both been members of the OFC and have since been, um, a, have since they had their membership a, revoked a, in 2021, but really it was because of inactivity, so I don't think anybody noticed, to be honest. Um, uh, in terms of research activities, just to give you an idea of what we're doing so far, as I said, I attended that conference and met with um, each of the women's development officers and, and the social responsibility officers. Now, we didn't interview all of those people. Um, uh, this is this is like a big steep learning curve for me as a researcher in the region. Um, uh, and it was brilliant to see other people trying to do what I would usually do and failing. Um, I'm a very much a, a, the like an elephant in clown shoes backing up a hill, you know, that's with cars parked on both sides of it, knocking into the wing mirrors and setting off the alarms and stuff. I'm very socially clumsy at the best of times. And the um, I'm hardly what people would describe as sophisticated, you know, and um, and so these, um, uh, these other people who I watched uh, take that approach to developing relationships with people in the region, uh, got about as far as I was warned um, uh, not to. Um, so meeting people, getting to know them a wee bit, letting them get to know me a wee bit, you know, listening and sharing stories was, was unbelievable experience just in itself. But then, so when we sat down to do the interviews, then we went, we went really well. And those interviews that we did do were really rich and thick and deep and all of those things, the way that people described them. So it was really, if nothing else, it was just really good for my soul to sit down with some just beautiful people as well. Um, we attended their tournaments, so I was at every match in the stand, like a proper football geek, um, totally loved it. Um, we did some fantastic work extending our networks with people at FIFA, with people at OFC, um, uh, with people in, in Fiji, UN uh, Women's uh, Organization as well. Um, as I said, we interviewed all sorts of people from, from women who played uh, in the 19, early, really early 1980s to right up to now, um, national players for Fiji and, and New Zealand. Um, we did some archival uh, research uh, at the National Archives in Suva, uh, spent a lot of time at the Fiji Times newspaper as well, and spent some time hanging out at the Fiji FA as well. Um, so we, as I said, we're making friends as we go. Um, Look, um, things that we're learning so far, some of these things are not surprising and some of the things that you had to do as well. Um, the Women's Development Officers and, and Fiji Football Association board members are really keen to learn how to build their community, as I said. So that was a great thing for us to learn because right away we've got, uh, we, we can offer expertise, but not necessarily expertise, but put them in touch with people who have expertise as well. So that, that was really useful as a wee thing just to learn. And it kind of... Uh, I think it's a nice illustration of, of how this research will work, I think. And we've learned about the game's early development in Fiji and in Solomon Islands, for example. We're building a narrative around the first international matches, which took place in 1983 in Numia. Um, we've learned um, that Pacific Island footballers love the game as much as their counterparts in other countries. You know, there's, I've got similar stories to, uh, from women in Fiji about sneaking out of the house in their school uniform or their work clothes with their football boots and their football strip in the bag. And I heard from Australian women doing the same thing, just a couple of decades apart. Um, 
Uh, we've and so that that's a great thing to learn. You know, I think um, it's the magic of football. It's the reason I love it. Um, I hate the expensive kind of circus of the men's world cup and, and these really expensive player wages and stuff like that. You know, it does it feels otherworldly, but I really love the good that football can do for people. Um uh, we've um I think one of the kind of um a uh, Oh uh, well, but it's not really. It's not to be. Uh, it's not unexpected. But irrespective of country or culture, um, women have experienced and continue to experience the same challenges women footballers experience in Australia and New Zealand and other countries around the world, which isn't a surprise, you know. But we can't go into these things assuming it's going to be the same for everybody. I think a horrifying commonality which occurs with depressing frequency is just how often rubbish men. Uh, who insist on telling women what they can and can't do and treating them really badly in the process. It's just, women's football is rife with men effectively who are just ridiculous obstacles to the game for no other reason than because they can. Um, significantly, um, I think some aspects of the approach and attitudes towards women's football um, anecdotally uh, at a public level um, are different uh, in women's football and certainly in Fiji than they are to say the women's rugby seven. So that was a really significant finding for us. Uh, the crowds are often there to watch Fiji, uh, the rugby sevens, the women's rugby sevens, to mock them. Um, whereas uh, the crowd that go to watch the women's football uh, are really supportive and really embraced of what's going on. And really, they don't care about the quality of the game or the football that's being played. They just want to see the football, which I think is absolutely brilliant. I think that um, COVID, as we can, as we all know, has had a massive impact on the game's development um, as well in the last two years, at a time when things had really started to accelerate in terms of the visibility of the game and the development of the game and the quality and all that stuff. Um, um, it was really heartening to see that the, the people on the ground at OFC and FIFA, despite what people would tell you about these organisations, are really trying their best, really brilliant people who's... Um, whose first priority is the development of the women's game, um, safeguarding, uh, looking after people, developing long-term stra strategies, you know, so that was really brilliant to see that. And it was really great that, that they, they, they want us to see that too, you know, they, they, and they, they, they're gl glad that we want that for them as well. Um, the United Nations Women Organization and the OFC have just signed a partnership in March, um, which is in its infancy, and they're taking their time, they're feeling each other out, they're looking at it, but the UN um, Women's Organization have a um, brilliant rugby project going on um, at the moment that, that might be a very a useful template, and they want someone to document that as well, so we may have been in the right place at the right time for that. Um, uh, what else? It looked at... The other thing I think that's worth pointing out is that there's a, a tremendous number of very sensitive uh, topics, uh, particularly as a man, uh, and so I'm really glad that I'm working with a couple of women on the project um, around gender equity, domestic violence, teenage pregnancy, sexual identity, like topics that, that we, we can't get near just now or even broach them. Um, uh, so that, that's that's going to be an interesting part of it. But certainly, the gender equity is something that I think that um, has to be explored further. Well, like all those things are. Don't get me wrong, but um, there are some kind of social barriers to how we go about doing that. I think, and I, like I'm only just learning about this stuff and how best to manage that stuff in the region as well. Um, look, there are a couple of projects underway, as I said, uh, that I think are worth looking at and that we aim to connect with. Um, or at least use as an example or learn from. Um, the, there's a brilliant project just got funding from the Olympic uh, Research Programme um, called uh, Pacific Football, um, of all things. It's been run by Emma Sherry. She's amazing. I, I've never met her, but her research is amazing. And, I, and one of my colleagues uh, does work with her very closely and uh, has underlined how amazing she is. Um, let's um, run out of the uh, sports research unit at Swinburne University. So we're going to be talking to them soon. Um, uh, we've already started talking to the United Nations women um, about that project and uh, the, the rugby. And then I, I found another brilliant project that I think might be worth looking at too that has some overlap with stuff that's going on in the uh, research centre. It's an ACIR, ACIAR. <laughs> Sorry, a project um, that's happening with rugby in Fiji, where 
for using agriculture and using uh, the popularity of rugby union uh, to drive projects around sustainable farming. Um, look, um, as I said, we know we can help Fiji FA, we know we can help Solomon Islands, and we're already starting to look at those things. Um, we've got, um, we started with publications, so in the next 12 months we'll have the, the two monographs and the anthology come in. Um, we've got, in addition to that, I think we've got a paper under review and at least two book chapters, but I, I suspect there's another at least another paper on the go. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, we um, we have talked about now um, in some detail um, a, a work of non-fiction about the history that's not academic um, that would be accessible for the women's development officers because they would like to use that as a resource for themselves so we can learn more about the game in their communities through the, those community officers. So, um, but until we've got these books put to bed, then that's that's going to have to sit and wait for a bit. Um, and then, and we'll follow the same kind of uh, paths as we did with, with the other project. We'll look at places like Conversation, Pacific Sisters, Beyond 90, and any other suggestions that other people have got for us to uh, disseminate, to contact, and, and to um, uh, share, share the stories that we've gathered about these amazing women and uh, really strong uh, men who are good allies for them. Um, look, um, as I said, um, we're working on finding some dollars. So if people have got ideas for that, we'd really love to talk to you. Um, uh, but like, honestly, it has to be uh, for the right reasons for the project. And, and, and obviously it's about meeting uh, us, helping that community meet their own needs, um, I guess is the, the first thing at the front of that. Thanks very much for your patience. I hope my, I wasn't speaking too quickly. And um, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So put up. Look. That's Kira Bass. Thank you, Tess. Kira Bass. Right. Kira Bass. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lee. I don't really know a better way to say it, but it was just a really cool presentation. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really cool work that you're involved in, <laughs> and it's just really good to hear about these strong. Um, Fit women from the Pacific playing soccer. So it, it was really fascinating. And yeah, thank you for sharing with us. Um, but yeah, we, we will open it up to questions now if anyone has I anything to ask. If yeah, I may. yeah so sure. Just wanted to share a little story because it reminded me when you made some comments. So most of you would know I'm like 30 or something years old. So I consider myself young. You're and doing I'm, well. You're yeah. doing well. You don't <laughs> look as old as that. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> I was born and raised in Costa Rica. So you tend to think like issues about gender discrimination in sports are sort of like an, an old thing, but it actually did happen to me. So I was really into football and I was in a really small school. And I once had a teacher, female teacher, come to me and say that I needed to sit with my female student friends instead of playing soccer because I needed to be more feminine. So that happened when I was like 10 years old and of course I did that the day and they came home so crushed crying my ass out telling my mom about what had happened and my mom that day said look we have two ways of solving this I can go to school with you tomorrow and talk to this teacher and the, and the principal or you can go tomorrow and stand up for yourself and say why it's football is important to you and what matters to you why you want to connect with your friends and so on and I did that like took a lot of bravery at the time for like a 10 year old girl Next one. but I always saw that as a really empowering moment in my life like at the end the principal almost fired this teacher and it, was like, <laughs> good, good. it became like a big thing in the school but like I think it's like a sometimes I have this impression that some people see soccer or sport especially soccer or football as something that's like low class that has like a stigma attached to it but I really believe in like the transformative power of sports especially team sports and they can what they can do to create like a well-rounded individual so I was wondering if like you're coming up with stories like this on how this is actually empowering people to 
better themselves and to stand up for themselves in, in this context? Look, the um, I think the stories do that. The stories do that themselves. I thank you for sharing your story. That's an absolutely brilliant story. I'm so glad you went back to school and did that. Well done. That must have taken some some courage, like you know. But um, it, it's sadly that's really it still happens now. It's really commonplace. Um, when um, when they banned women's football in the 1920s, it was part part of the grounds for it was people felt it was effeminate. And uh, here in Australia, what we saw happen in the 19 a second half of the 1920s was an uptake in games like hockey and women's netball. Um, well, netball was women's basketball at the time, but the game changed to netball in the 1970s. And then, um, and then, um, and a, an Australian sport that I still can't really get my head around called Figaro or some Pogoro or mm -hmm. something like that, right? And the commonality between those sports was that people had to wear a skirt. You know, so they were deemed as more effeminate eh, just because you had to wear a skirt. But people were knocking each other's teeth out with sticks and stuff like that, you know. So, so um, and one of the things I think that's really sad about the project is that we keep coming across those stories happening even now. You know, like we, we, we meet um, women and girls. A guy laughed at my daughter when she was playing football. She was the only girl on the football team, you know. And um, so, so we experienced that stuff. But I think, like, the more we see it, the easier it gets for people and the more accepting people become of um, the, the, mo the more acceptable it, it becomes as a behaviour for people to undertake. You know, like that, there's a brilliant story in the media just now about the manly sea eagles putting the, uh, the right. rainbow on their shirts, you know, and rather than uh, rather than these guys who 10 years ago would have looked like they were doing the right thing for refusing to wear the jerseys, the backlash has been the opposite, you know. So we've come a long way in 10 years in terms of inclusivity and, and women being treated appropriately in, in most kind of Western or global northern countries, but still, like, the, the main blockers are still, like, men who think they know better and... Uh, people who've been misled to think that it's all right to tell somebody they can't do something like that because like you I believe that football has something transformative in it that changes people's lives in really positive ways except except at the top of FIFA where it's really corrupt and stuff yeah. <laughs> that's only my opinion and not the opinion of US the UNESC or the <laughs> of <laughs> you know or the Australian Centre for Pacific Island Research <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Yes, so thank you, well done. So I think Tess has a question. She's got her hand up, so feel free to turn your microphone off, Tess. Thank you, and thanks, Lee, for that um, presentation. Um, I didn't manage to get to any of the OFC games when I was in Silver the week before last, but my friend uh, Linda was doing a great job of managing the Vanuatu team and keeping them all on track. Great, great. Um, one in relation to Fiji, one of the issues that has become apparent across the sevens, uh, and I guess I think I'm thinking more of the men's sevens, is that it it does tend to split along racial lines. So it, you don't see very many Indo-Fijians or Fijians of, with Indi Indian heritage playing sevens. In fact, I don't think you. Really, I don't. I think basically they don't play at all. How does that um, affect? the football scene and particularly the women's football scene is it is it you know does it cluster it within one part of that community or is it a bit more cross-cutting um Tess, that's an absolutely brilliant question thank you and i've just started following your work on twitter when i was over there as well uh, so I'd, I'd be keen to catch up with you and have a chat about the region as well so thank you for your research i think it's brilliant the um a, it's a really interesting thing, isn't it, um, where you have that a divide between the Indo-Fijians and the Indigenous Fijians. Um, the in, Indo-Fijian women tend to be treated the worst out of any of the, the, of, of the communities um, a, because the, even the Indigenous, this is, and like I'm just quoting what I was told here, but um, I was told that the uh, football, soccer is a place where Indo-Fijian men are able to exert their masculinity in ways that uh, they were they are never they're not ever going to be physically capable enough to do when it, when you look at the, the, the physicality that is required for uh, for the rugby sevens. Um, but the um, uh, uh, but that the but the if 
people want to play football, they're generally allowed to play football. So it is much more inclusive than the rugby sevens are. Um, but it's, but that only, that's only when it comes to the men's game. For the women's game, um, considering it's the most popular sport amongst Indo-Fijians, um, now, if you looked at the Fijian team the other night, there was two players from that from an Indian Fijian background, and the other nine players in the first team are all from indigenous uh, uh, families. Um, but it, it is definitely more uh, it is definitely more um, integrated as a sport. But the the management of the game is dominated by Indian Fijians. <laughs> Well, thanks, Lee. Um, does anyone else have any final questions and or comments for Lee before we finish up the session today? Yeah, I um I had a quick question. So, um, obviously, you've had a lot of conversations with uh, these uh, female footballers, and I was just wondering what are some of the biggest lessons you've been able to learn yourself from them and from their stories. Uh, to keep my mouth shut and listen, Amy, probably is uh, one of the most important things. Uh, I, I'm a talker, naturally. I love telling stories. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody can see Tara laughing her ass off here sitting beside me, right? She's a cheeky beggar, I have to say, right? The um, uh, yeah, I love I love to tell stories and share stories in particular. You know, I, I think it, it's a really integral part of Scottish culture where it's raining all the time and we're all in the pub and we all speak to each other and talk over the top of each other and offer people as much unsolicited advice as possible, right? Um, like I've been on a bus in Scotland reading a book quietly and a fella tapped me on the shoulder and said, see that book? You don't want to read that book. You probably want to read the one he wrote just before that one. Do you know, like, just like from a complete stranger telling me what book I should read, do you know, like, so, but I, lo I love that, do you know what I mean, I love that, and, it, and that's like a really difficult thing for me to put aside eh, when I'm sitting there, um, so that, I, I, that, for me personally, that's a big lesson, that's a really valuable lesson to learn, I think uh, there are so many things that we can take away, Amy, um, I am constantly in awe of the resilience of these women, um, I am, um, uh, I'm really excited to run home and tell my wife and especially my daughters about these incredible women as well, right? Because they, like my wife, especially my youngest, she just lights up. You know, when I bring home another Shiro for her to think about, she thinks that's absolutely brilliant, right? Because she tends to men are rubbish anyway. But the um, uh, so that, those are, that's two of the things I think in terms of um. I guess the, as I said in the presentation, what isn't a surprise is that the challenges that these women have have a, in front of them in terms of developing the game are, um, a, are very similar to the challenges that we see in women's sport in other places. I think one of the difficulties um, around uh, football and sport in general in the Pacific Islands is logistics and, and, and the geography, you know, um, to just for example, one of the FIFA people was telling me that in order just to get say the Cook Island team together and fly them a uh, two Fiji, uh, you're looking at somewhere in the region of 100 to 120,000 Australian dollars, you know, and so um, that's just to get them there for the tournament, let alone paying them, getting them to play, you know, like all of that stuff. So, like, if you compare that to put, bringing a French team together, which would cost nothing like that, you know, uh, for example. So, so that, um, uh, like, that kind of stuff um, was really fascinating and interesting to hear. Um, I also, I understand that um, the diasporas of each of the countries is a really big, uh, a really big factor in that as well. Um, I, I, I need to check these figures, but I believe that um, the population of Cook Islanders in New Zealand uh, is almost or over five times the population of Cook Islanders actually living in the Cook Islands. You know, and so uh, when these teams are like Samoa and that, they, the Samoan team had one player from the US, one player from the UK, one player from New Zealand, one player from Australia and five players from New Zealand in their, in their squad, in the tournament squad. Um, so when you're looking at trying to bring a squad like that together, you know, it's a really big job, a really difficult process, you know. It also speaks to the fact that it's brilliant that these women are getting opportunities and playing overseas as well at the same time, you know, but um, because there is more money in, in England, for example, the wages are getting really good and the top European teams, the wages are really good as well. Women are earning 
a, a full time wage, a, um, which is uh, like a I know it's ridiculous, but it's been a major step forward. So 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 there's a number of different factors there. So I learned a lot, Amy, in short, is what I'm telling you. Sorry, that was a really long answer. No, no, no. We we love to hear it. That's why we're all here. Um, I had one last question as well too, which uh, uh, you talked a bit about community development being a, a big issue sort of within the industry. What are some tips that you have um, for community development and how some of us could best go about that? Oh, look, as I said, um, you've got two ears and one mouth. Just keep, just remember that, right? Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that's the, that's the key thing. As I said, I watched two people uh, from a separate organisation who were trying to build relationships and were just storming in, demanding people get back to them, you know, like all that kind of stuff. Um, be patient, um, listen, um, be clear about what it is that you want and what it is that you're uh, interested in. Um, I, I found that there's this brilliant level of, incredible level of welcoming and um, a... a what's the word then, hospitality, right? But, it's, but and, and uh, the Fijian people were incredibly polite as well, you know? So you'll always get that. Um, but actually, if you want to get deeper than that, it is, about, it is about just sitting on your hands and keeping your mouth shut and just listening, you know, asking questions, you know? And so I think if you're going to do research that's involved in interviewing people, those are my best tips. Thanks for that. Hey, uh, Lee, before when Tess asked you a question around Indo-Fijian participation. It? No, no, you did. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a really in-depth answer. Sorry. No, 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 it's good. Um, but Rajesh, Rajesh has actually just popped a comment in the chat for you mm -hmm. uh, or for everyone. Oh, now I've lost it. Hang on. i got to get that. He said that there are some Indo-Fijian. I said there's two women yes. in the first team. Yeah, yeah. Mm, but he, two out of 11 is a really low percentage. No, that's yeah. it, yeah. He's just commented just saying that cultural obstacles were the biggest hurdle for Indo-Fijian women participating in football type sports, um, but that now those barriers seem to be going down, um, which is really good to hear. Yeah, yeah. When, when we hear that this what like any change is great, right? For the change, yeah. we'd like to see those that, those things happening faster. I think. Yeah. For yeah. we should have a chat, mate. <laughs> I can see that. Yes, you can. Uh, you are most welcome. I'm very interested in soccer, although I'm a I'm a biological scientist. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. But, you should have yeah, a chat. Yeah. Next time you are in Fiji, come over to USP, and then we can we can meet up. Yeah. And if you have got any email addresses, we can we can communicate before you do. Definitely, definitely. I've got yeah. Mohit Prasad's book here. I got given two different copies of it from two different people. Come again. Uh, do you know Mohit Prasad? His yes, book? I know Mohit Prasad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've got Mohit's book, the, the history one that he wrote. And yeah, yeah. Sort of uh, I've got that here, but there's not much in it about women's football. So I'd love to talk to you about women's football. When when when, when those books were written, that, that were uh, in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s, there wasn't too much of, I mean, while there were local football, but there were Kind, there weren't many international kind of exposure to the to the teams and with the advent of women's soccer all over the world as you have told in the history you know it's only after the world cups women's world cup that you know the interest had been generated and then we have got these girls you know who actually one of the girls uh who is playing uh, in the fiji team right now he lives in uh, america and the other one lives in australia so and i think that that has helped in the development as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and now I'm I'm seeing, you know, because I'm I'm a follower of football, and I'm seeing, uh, you know, a lot of great players coming up, and, and as you would have seen in the matches, you know, there's some very brilliant players, uh, coming from uh, in the Fiji team coming from various districts. Yeah, yeah, well, and, well, well, yeah, yeah, from Lombasa who play in the middle of the park. Well, Demon Demon Sal, yeah. Yeah, 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 brilliant. Hey, yeah. um, sorry, Rajesh. I just noticed that Tess has put up a brilliant tip about um, uh, about not being extractive. Tess, absolutely. That's what that's what um, my colleague Yoko Kanamasu um, underlined when I was over there, and Stephen uh, Professor Underhill said the same thing too. Is that um, uh, when you go, people are absolutely tired of um, particularly white white researchers landing in the region and just getting what they need and then just pissing off, you know, and, and not doing anything, you know, and so, but I, and I think that's, 
um, with the book that we're working on, we're really keen to use it as a conversation starter rather than the, than the end of a thing, you know, and so um, we, we'll, we'll address the contract, get the book published and use that as a platform to build build work using the knowledge that we have. We want to do this for a while because I'm a huge football fan, you know, and yeah, I love the region, so it'll be great. And before we finish up as well, too, uh, Tracy's been waiting very patiently. She's got her hand up. So, well, if it's all right, uh, we'll let her have a question. Yes, sir. I think my question does relate. Thank you, Lee. That was fascinating. I will save the many anecdotes that um, probably we all have when, when watching such a presentation. Um, what I wanted to ask you was um, with the release of this story, um, it sounds like you've already conducted some research and some interviews with the women, but what are their thoughts in terms of the benefits of, of telling the story? And um, I was going to ask about their concerns, but let's stick with benefits and end on a, on a positive note. What would be the benefits to those women who you interview of telling this story? Look, they, um, um, they uh, especially with the COVID and especially with the technological barriers as well, you know how reliable the Wi-Fi is. So, they um, are really would really like lots of help to develop the game. You know, um, I think one of the things that um, is really happening to hear was that the OFC um, have a bucket of money um, that the women's development officers can apply for. Um, and um, I better watch what I'm saying. There's a bucket of money that they, they can apply for, and there's been some trans some rules around transparency and how that money gets used. And the, um, so that's really good. Unfortunately, the women's development officers, as, as you can probably imagine, are so busy that to take the time to sit down and get the grant, put the grant application together and develop a program to, for the funding and stuff like that. And so they, they, need, they need help with that stuff. So one of the benefits, I guess, of us pulling this stuff together and then being able to connect people to other people that are doing some similar or different stages along the road so there are benefits in that community development, you know, at a, at a kind of a, at a community level, you know, where we can find ways to help each other more effectively, I think, um, in that. And so, uh, but also as well, um, when we have uh, provided this narrative, um, then they, they have that in their hands to show other people now, you know, as well. Um, so that when I was talking to the technical director um, at the, uh, Fiji Football Association. He's just managed to secure a sponsorship with McDonald's to develop a mixed uh, league for the first time uh, in, in Fiji. Um, and then they're, they're looking next at women's football. So if they've gone in with lots of information, including some, some like an anecdote, you say, do you know, women have been playing this sport here for over 40 years, you know, like that's really useful for them to be able to use that stuff. So there's benefits in uh, developing the narrative. We've seen already seen that stuff start to play out here in Australia. Uh, and so we're assuming that they can use it for the same types of things there. Um, and obviously they, they, their concerns are, um, as, as you can imagine, gender equity um, and, and all, all the stuff that goes along that goes along with that um, uh, for the most part. And, and actually just getting a chance to play football and have a laugh and play football, you know, like that's really what, what we're all doing it for, you know. And so so that's that's one of the things that they look for in it too. Okay. Oh, that was useful. Yeah, I'm sure it was. All right. Well, I think that might be it. If there's no Good. more questions, thank Good. you so much. I'm Lee. glad it's fun. Yeah. I was so <laughs> nervous. Yeah, there was lots of thank yous. I'm not sure if you ever got a chance to see them, but um, no, I was too busy trying to make sure I made <laughs> I didn't sense. I did not think you did, but maybe oh, that's you know. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us, and we hope to see you at our next seminar. Magic. Thank you. Thank you.